Greece sucks. That's what I hear all the time. Greece sucks. Is it true? I think Greece sucks, actually. All the startups where they tell me if this works. Do you guys have a job? I, I think somebody asked, like, how old were you? I think it's Gary. I think you have a job because uh, here you're lucky. Six, that's the number of youth unemployment in Greece. 64.2% uh, uh, of youth are people under 25 without a job. So Greece sucks. You don't want to be a public servant. Everybody used to want to be a public servant in Greece. Greece sucks. You know what? These jobs are gone. It's, oh, sorry, I can go as fast as I want with this. Jobs are completely gone. There's no more jobs in Greece. Greece sucks. Okay? And it's easy for me because I'm Greek, but I'm also Swiss, so I can play on both sides. There's no money, no broadband, no industry in Greece. That's all I keep hearing about from startups. And uh, sorry if I could do that. You're not rich. You're not always on, meaning you don't have access to technology, and, you're not, and people are not tech savvy in Greece. I hear that as well all the time. You have limited resources, oh, they're so lucky in the Silicon Valley. We don't have money, they do. Greece sucks. Is it true? I don't know. We'll look at it in a bit. First of all, jobs. Jobs are failing worldwide. It's not only here in Greece are failing, they're failing all over the planet. The crisis in 2008 that wiped out all these jobs is the first crisis since, and uh, there are studies about it, it's the first crisis in the last 100 years where there's been a GDP recovery but not a jobs recovery. There's no, these jobs have been wiped out, have not been recovered since then. So basically what happens is that the world has been disrupted. We have not seen it because disruption happens so fast that we just usually don't see it. Disruption is a deflation game. Deflation means that the price are falling. They're falling so fast right now and we don't see it. Think about YouTube. YouTube versus television. YouTube has a, a, a 1 billion uniques a month. There's 1 billion people going and watching a YouTube video every single month. This is going, this is the mass scale that YouTube has that television doesn't have. It, 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 it offers a mass scale and it lowers the price very, very, very quickly. TV is addicted to large margins. YouTube is not because they have the scales. Incumbents are addicted to large margins. This is how they work. This is what you do as startups. So now if you think as well, you think emerging countries versus industrialized countries, there you have it. The emerging countries have been disrupting our game. They provide mass scale, they provide lower price, and they provide a mass workforce. And this is what has been having. Of course, I think you think China, but not only. The rest of the world basically has woken up. The West, the incumbent, was addicted to large margins. We are the incumbents, the emerging markets are the, the startups. We had it too good, we had access to resources, we had everything we wanted, we were just picking the resources and the money where we wanted. It was really, really easy. And we had Everything we wanted. We had a lot of jobs, a lot of money. We had a lot of the access. Everything was good. It was so good because we were like alone, the being the incumbents, and all the rest was working for us. This is gone. This is over. We are being disrupted. And I say we because I was born in Switzerland. I'm a pure model of a Western guy. So I'm being disrupted by these models as well. Sorry for that. Uh, you love your technology. I love my technology. I've been tweeting all night long, and I'm sure people, I see people are tweeting here. You love your technology. Technology is becoming global. As you can see, it is only for the big, um, big networks. As you can see, this line here represents the number of people accessing around the world, and the first line is the US. Just to see that the, the, the internet has become so much more global than it used to be, for instance, when I had a startup in the 90s. You love your mobile technologies. You all use your mobile phone here. Greeks are addicted to their smartphones. Same thing, explosion, the explosion. Look at this, the, this is the, the number of PCs being sold since the 2000s. And look at the growth of the mobile. Uh, this is only smartphones, by the way, right? This is the, f the biggest explosion of, of technology in the history of technology, actually. 71% of pe literate people, so people that can read and write, will have, by 2017, will have a, a, a smartphone in their hands. It's staggering. It's something that we have not seen coming. It's the biggest shift ever. Again, this is the number of... of of um, devices that will be connected to the internet. Look at the numbers. This was mainframe computers. This was basically the PC era. It's massive. It's a platform ship that nobody has seen coming. You love your wearable technologies. You love data. You love everything will be connected. All these data, and you know that. You know you feel that because you're all geeks. You feel that everything will be connected within each other. Everything will talk with to each other, which seems great, right? Remember how you? I mean, I fly a lot. I'm sure you've flown in your life. 
you're pretty young, but maybe you still remember. You used, to, you used to buy a ticket, you would go to the counter, and you would talk to someone that would actually print you, or even sometimes you know, just write you down the boarding pass. You had human interaction. It was a human-to-human -human process. Nowadays, when you fly, you do everything online. It's a machine-to-machine -machine process. It's not anymore a human-to-human -human process. Humans are being disrupted in, the, in that flow. So now think about how do you drive today. When you drive today, and you just, you know, you take your car, you make a decision where you want to go, you have a hell of a time, especially in Athens, to actually park, and it's a human-to-human -human interaction. Of course, there's an automobile involved, but it's still a human-to-human -human interaction. How will you drive tomorrow? When you'll drive tomorrow, and of course, everybody thinks you're a Google driverless car, it will be da data-driven. Imagine you're in a car, the car will talk to other cars, the, actual the car will know before you get to some point, uh, uh, it will optimize your route, right? Because of data, because of uh, uh, access to parking, because of everything. And you will just be sitting there and waiting for the car to drive you to your destination. It's a machine-to-machine -machine, uh, process. And I'm not even talking about automation of, you know, you can think about factories or robotization. I used to live in Japan. There's a lot of robotization that happens because of people getting older. I could go on and on and on, but basically, it's a revolution. I didn't see it coming, but it's a revolution that we're actually living. It's an efficiency revolution. It's not the revolution we used to have. It's, very, it's just about playing on the margins. Again, disruption, playing on the margins. And it's a, it's a, it's a revolution that basically do not need humans. Where will be the jobs? Who needs humans and everything is machine to machine? Basically, are we going to live a world of prosperity? Because, of course, these this efficiencies, the new revolution, digital, is bringing a lot of prosperity. And we see that the, the, we, people, uh, companies are making a lot of money. Countries are actually developing because of digital. But prosperity without access, because the people will not have enough money to access this technology. Is that the case? I don't know, but we'll see in a minute. So we are being disrupted. So what happens now? What do, what do I do with that? Uh, if I could oh, see technology. Uh, I want to just few, uh, mention a few emerging ideas. First of all, I think new identities are emerging. New identities, I mean, we've seen the, the community is happening. So Facebook, of course, Twitter. I put uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Davian Hart here. But think about all these online communities. I've been. These are emerged communities because they're already mature to a certain extent nowadays, right? They've been on for five to ten years, depending on how you count. There was these mass scale and networks enabled trust and openness to be something we live in our daily lives, especially for people like you. I'm a bit older, so I'm still sometimes uneasy about it. Basically. The top-down identities were defined top-down. Your education system, your country, where you're coming from, your parents, and the identities are now become, are become defined on a peer-to-peer -peer matter. You don't define yourself because of where you come from. You define yourself because of other people. It's everything. It's the peer-to-peer -peer networks that are being built. Tribalism. These are the three points for me very important. People are thinking groups. They think, I'm a geek, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a startup guy, I'm, I, whichever you want. You, could, you remember, I don't know if any of you were, uh, grew up and felt alone in a classroom because you know, nobody liked you, nobody was like you. Now basically with the internet you can say, oh, you know, there's this guy in Japan who's actually like me. And it validates you. You don't have to think like, oh, I'm going to be bullied, or I'm, gonna, I'm alone, or I'm going to even commit suicide because nobody understands me. People don't understand you. It's a tribal. Second, second nomadism. People travel. People move around. I'm not saying that you need to travel, but you have access to travel. And people now not, do not define home anymore. And I've, I know I'm an outlier, but they don't define home anymore as a place where you were born. They define home as a place where you belong. And that's very, very different. And third one, singularism. You don't give a shit about the others. You are who you are. And what we, the world we're living in, I know it's emerging, allows you to do that. You can be whatever. I, don't, I haven't wear a suit in seven years. And I go to the biggest corporations and I never wear a suit. I'm always with denim. If you don't understand it, I don't give a shit. Otherwise, don't pay me. I'm going to have another client. So we have new identities. It, of course, that creates new co cons consumers. For you, startups are actually very interesting because these are the guys you're going to sell your products to. And these consumers are empo empowered and aware. Of course, many people are social media experts. You always use that term, but that's, that's where they are. They can actually talk to each other and talk, talk to you, talking back. And what do they look? These are the four things. Meaning, engagement, convenience, personalization. These are the four big factors that define our identities today. We look for meaning. This is what, the, what I put in red. You want meaning in your life. You're not defined by things anymore. You're not buying things anymore. You're defined by actions.
access to experiences. People want experiences today. They want to, they, you used to be defined because you had a Volvo or you had a BMW. Now you just want access to experiences. You want to, sorry, you, want, you, will, you will buy experiences more than you will buy uh, things. And that's why uh, somebody mentioned Incredible. I think it was you, Robin, before. Incredible provides experience. You're not the owner of a boat. You can experience the fact to live on a boat. So this is what these identities and new consumers are like that. And we want to share these experiences with other people. So it's a, we're defined more and more by ac access to things instead of owning things. The marketplaces are, of course, into that. Airbnb, Relay Ride, Lending Club, Angelist, that you're forced to know your startups, Udemy. These are examples of marketplaces that allow people to access stuff and not to buy stuff. They access experience, they access money, they access deal flow, they access cars, they access or places, and even, even luxury places. There's many, many places like that. So this is the first idea. As a startup, you have to create these P2P marketplaces for emerging identities. This is the model that, that is actually emerging in the most, at a very, very uh, rapid pace. Seven minutes, I'm gonna do it. So the youth today, people are born today, will have 16 jobs by the, uh, sorry, 18 jobs by the age of 36. How many jobs did you have? Did you have, who's 35? Did you have more, more than the desk? Did you have less jobs than that? How many jobs did you have? Three jobs. Okay, this is the number of people born today. We'll have 18 jobs by the age of 36. So the definition, and that's, that's okay, the definition of what is a job is changing. It used to be my, my, my father always freaks out with what I do. He tells he doesn't understand. I always move around. He doesn't understand what I'm doing. The only question he asks is, he says, Paul, do you have enough money? That's it, because their generation, the old generation, was a generation of having one job and one career. We keep changing all the time. See Robin, he changed many, many times. He does conferences. He, does, he worked in many, many different um, uh, blog networks. So the, the workforce is also becoming global. And I don't know if you know Odesk and Elance. It allows you to access people. I can do access, access uh, human resources. You need someone. You just going to do a request on, on an Odesk or Elance. Other very, very big factor. In the next 10 years, a billion women will enter the workforce in the world. A billion women. This is one of the, also the biggest change that will happen. Of course, you're not, we're not talking in Western Europe, we're talking mostly about emerging countries, but billion women will access the workforce. That's also changed the dynamics of not only the workforce, but of what they want to purchase. Women have a very high purchase decision in couples, by the way. Bigger planner, bigger workforce. Archimedes, you know that, they said that because you're Greek. You know, they famously shouted Eureka. And the whole story is a myth. He was alone and he found an idea. That's not true. He was actually living in a city. The city was Syracuse. So, and what I like, I like about that is about this reality is that cities are the center of, in, of innovation. Cities are where, this is, a, this is a study that was done by the MIT. There's a, concept called superlinearity. That means that ideas in when there's a cluster of people go much faster, also diseases by the way, like HIV, but go much faster in a very concentrated environment, which are cities, than if you live in a rural area. Why does it matter? Because I believe that actually the internet is becoming that city. This is the number of people online. When I was in the startup, we had like a roughly this. Nowadays, we're around, you know, 2 billion people, and by 2020, there will be 5 billion people online. This is the new city. This is the innovation cluster. So the internet is at the center of this, uh, of, of this, uh, of this revolution. It's the new city. I'm not saying that everything is self-perfect and you can actually live in a city, live within the internet. I'm just saying that leverage these, these ideas. It's a local city because you don't need to actually, um, you don't need to move. You can just be within the internet. People can be on an island and still be part, and that's what Exaxo was saying earlier. You don't have to actually be part, to actually move in a big city to move to, move to New York, London, or Tokyo. You can be here in Athens and still be part of the networks. So leverage the emerging null workforce is my second idea. So Silicon Valley is rich, always on a tech savvy. It's always out here. This is why all, all of you guys want to move there, right? And it's, but in a world of traders, of, with limited resources, the world we're actually living in now, the, 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 the shift is completely changed. We're a world of sharers. It's a barter world where people trade stuff within each other. Airbnb, all these models, people trade stuff. Okay, this is not a world where people buy stuff. So this is why you have an advantage, guys, because emerging markets have always dealt with limited resources, unlike us, the West. The jobs were harder to get, people have to deal with a lot of limited resources, even on an individual level. It was not only on a, on a global level. And with limited resources, you have no choice but to accelerate. Accelerate what? Breaking conventions. You love that in startups, right? You have to break conventions, you have no other choice. You have to accelerate your IDs. These are factors for emerging. Like, as you see, this is a study, basically, 
Cost is not what people look at when they go to uh, emerging markets. What they want, of course, market access, but the tech know-how. So if you have good tech know-how in Greece, you can actu actually attract investors, and I'll come to that in a minute, even though I have three minutes and 43 seconds. So, ID replication, because this is, I, I added that yesterday because I really want to talk about that. This is a temple that uh, sits in the middle soul. It, was, it burned down in 2008. It burned down to the ground, and it was replaced by a new one. So it's not original, but you still visit it. It's a very foreign concept. The reason I say that is that in the, in, in the West, we hate copy. We say, oh, you're a copycat. That's insanity. Copy, you know, you always have this creed of ID versus execution. No matter, I don't care if many people have the same ID, copy, that's okay. And that's what emerging markets are very good at, because they had to copy with limited resources. They had to adapt the model to their, their, their own countries. I'm going to share, so you're going to see that, but basically some the products, and this is exactly in the startup creed, the products are, that come from emerging markets are usually not high-end, they're mid-end or low-end. They're simple products. And you know, we keep saying in the startup creed, keep it simple, stupid. This is this. Simple products, robust products, low-end products, not high-priced products. These are emerging markets are made for this world of startups, not the West, not industrial countries, even though they're doing it good, of course. So you're not rich, you're not always done, not tech savvy, doesn't matter. You can create a different model, a more resilient model, a constrained model, a more efficient model. I'm not going to talk about that. A model that is replicable across cultures, a radical model even. And to answer Two of you guys, I think it was Sam. I think actually corporate investment is more important than VC investment in these emerging countries because this is where the money is going to come from. You can discuss that after, at, at, at the break after my talk. And also socially good model, but we can discuss that later. So adopt, Greece, and Greece should, should do that, adopt the emerging market creed. Be an emerging market. So Greece sucks? Yes, maybe it sucks. But you know what? Perceived disadvantages can become a force. I mean, think Aikido, for instance, when you use, of course, the power of someone else to actually empower him. So Greece, and I am, and I've suffered through that, there's a myth of laziness here in Greece. People are lazy. You know, they're all the South, pigs, right? Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. People are just lazy. But it can become actually a force. And I'm just going just gonna to go through a few of the cliches. Greece sleeps all the time. You know what? These are all, and I'm not going to go through, but these are all studies that made by, by universities. Sleep empowers creative, creativity. Greeks are dreamers, but daydreaming actually pushes creativity. Greeks are romantics, you know, we love, you know, Rebetic or the music we have is very melancholic. We're very romantic, but you know what? Fiction fuels people that read fictions not only are more creative, but actually they have more resistance to disorder. People that are too brainiac, they have no resistance to disorder. As a startup, as an emerging market, you want to be resistant to disorder. Greeks are noisy. You know what? Human noise fuels creativity again. It fuels it. Greeks stay outdoors, you know, we always out, we always party and everything. Going out fuels creativity. And I'll, all the links are on the slides that I'll put online. So Greece sucks? I'm not that sure. Greece is a startup. And this is how you have to think about Greece. Greece is a startup. Greece has to adopt this emerging market creed. You are a startup. Your country is a startup. Stop believing you're a Western country. Stop thinking you're part of, the, of Europe. Of course you are, geographically and also legally because you're in the EU. But think as Greece as a startup. This is how you're going to get out of the crisis you're in. Greece can beat the pioneer gap, and I'll go that another time because I don't have time now. So adopt this emerging market creed. You have the talent, you have the passion, you have the creativity, you have the workforce. You build for these four things that I meant before. Meaning, engagement, convenience, personalization. This is what Greece is about. People come to Greece to find their roots, to find the history, to understand where Europe is, where democracy is born. So enjoy this and use this as leverage. Don't try to be Silicon Valley. Use these forces, the forces that you have in Greece, to actually transform the country. Greece has no choice. So from crisis to catharsis, Greece has to emerge. Greece has to become that emerging market. Thank you.